What's up, y'all? My name is Wes Giffen. I'm the Associate Director of Youth and Young Adults for the Diocese of Baton Rouge, and this is the New Testament in 15 minutes, or sort of. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. So uh, last week, Miss Haley DeLon talked to you guys about the Old Testament and the Bible, and we started off with like talking about what does the Bible like? What is the Bible? What does the word Bible come from? Where does it even what does it even mean? And she said that it was what? Do we remember? It was a library, right? The Bible comes from the word meaning a library or a collection of books or collection of texts that are all geared towards a specific purpose, function, a specific meaning. Um, and what is, uh, what is that meaning? What is that task of the Bible? And it's essentially a roadmap for us to return back to the Father. It's a, it's an, it's a way for us to return and a way for us to, um, because of the, well, let's back up. Let's before, because of the stain of sin, um, we've kind of been separated. We've, we've you know, fallen man. We've been fallen. So uh, in order for us to find our way back home to the Father, we need a road map. We need a way to get there. And the Bible is a series of, co it's a collection of books that help us bring us closer and orient ourselves back towards the Father and away from sin. And so, um, and, all of, and, in, and in the Old Testament, we see a lot of the Jewish people create a bunch of laws uh, that were geared towards, again, orienting us to the Father and away from sin. But what we came to found out was all throughout a long history that no matter how, how much, how many laws we create that control the body, without a law that controls the heart, uh, that really takes command of the heart, all those laws really don't have that much of an effect because human history, we see through all the Old Testament that it's very cyclical. The, Jew, the Jewish people are freed, they're, they're redeemed. Then they praise the Lord, but then they forget, they fall into sin, they get captured, they get commanded by, insert any random uh, ancient empire here, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Persians, the, uh, the Macedonians, the, um, the, the Romans, just you name them. Uh, we, we were invaded and ta taken captive by all of them, and it all follows this cyclical pattern, and it didn't matter how many laws they created, humanity always fell back into that pattern. Um, and so we needed a law. We were looking for something. We needed something that conveyed to the heart. And it was all in the prophecy. All the Old Testament prophets, all the old prophecies, all said that, like, something's coming. There's going to be something. It's going to be something that's going to be written on our hearts. It's going to give us hearts of flesh. It's going to be a guy. He's going to be there. We're going to call him Messiah or something crazy. And he's going to be this guy that, that, take, that leads us there, that leads us to this newness, this new heart, this new place, this new kingdom. And everybody from there started started trying to figure out, okay, what's he gonna be like? What's this thing? What's this thing's coming? What's what's coming at us? And who's this guy? Is he gonna be like this great emperor, this great warlord that we're just gonna rule the whole world? We're gonna conquer the entire world with the sword? And it turns, spoiler alert, um, most of those people who made those predictions were in fact wrong, <laughs> and a lot of expectations were shattered. And this is where we find ourselves. We find ourselves leaving it off with the Old Testament. All of humanity, well, all the Jewish people, and then all of humanity as well, were holding their breath, waiting for this moment, waiting for this newness to take over, waiting for something to come and rescue us, to get us out of this cycle, to break this loop. And this is where we find ourselves in, uh, in our topic today, which is the New Testament. What is, what is essentially, what is the New Testament? It's a collection, again, it's like, just like the Bible. What we were talking about, just like the whole Bible, it's a collection of books. Uh, there's 27 broken out into, into, different, into different kinds, styles of writing, different books, different things geared towards different, um, different goals and different audiences, which as we can see, uh, as we can see from uh, the Old Testament as well, is going to follow that similar pattern. Um, so we're leaving off, we're, we're leaving off in the Old Testament. Um, and there's about a 500, I guess there's a, there's a little period of time where there's no writings, there's no, nothing has been written down, um, and we're waiting. And so what happens? Well, at the beginning, <laughs> at the beginning of our, our New Testament, we have four books, and we call those uh, the Gospels. Um, those are the ones we hear. It's the third reading every Sunday at Mass. You hear it, it's going to be there. We all stand up. Right, I'll do the standing up thing, and everyone's like, "Why are we standing?" Um, you know, it's kind of it's kind of one of those things where like we all stand up. We, those are the gospels. We always stand for the gospels. Um, and anytime someone asks me, Wes, I want to read scripture. I want to get. I want to know scripture. I want to know it better. Where do I even start? 
Well, we're going to start with the four Gospels. So anytime someone asks me where to begin in Scripture, I always tell them, start with the Gospels. Start, start by reading the words of Jesus. And like that's what these four, there's four of them. You know, call them Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Usually when you hear them in, in, the, in the Bible, they're organized a different way, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But we're going to organize them this way, and there's a reason why. I'm going to, I'm going to say that in a second. But the Gospels... Um, come from the word uh, evangelium, which means good news, or to proclaim the good news. Well, what's so good about it? I mean, like, I, I look at the news all the time, and it's like, it's pretty, it's pretty not good. Like, most of the news that we hear today is, like, not very good. Well, that's the whole part of this. It's like, this is the good news. This is the promise. These are, these are the, uh, th this is, this is the bulk, this is the meat and potatoes of everything you need to know. This is the climax of all of human history, summed up into four books, that all tell a, a slightly altered version of the exact same story. And a lot of critics of the Bible also, uh, all like to say stuff like, oh, well that book is different, it, it says something a little bit out of order than this one, and this one, doesn't, this one doesn't quite tell the exact same story. But to me, the fact that four different books written in four different times of human history, and because that's important, these books were written in different places, in different times of human history, all tell the same story about the same human being that almost to me confirms the fact that this story is is a truthful story because think about it like four different people aren't going to tell the same story the exact same way but if they get all the major events right and they tell the and they and they tell it in a in a very similarly patterned story all conveying the exact same details about who someone is because that's what that's how they're written. They're not written as a narrative, like or like a like a history, like where like okay, this happened first, and this happened second, and this happened third. No, no, no. It's written as a story about who someone is. So think about this real quick. Like you're telling a story about your best friend. I, you want to tell me a story about your best friend. How are you going to start that story off? Well, first he was born, and then he learned how to use a spoon. And then, no, you're gonna start off with some cool stuff first. You're gonna tell me like, oh man, my friend, like, dude, he's awesome. You got like this awesome story we had together. And then you're gonna put together some other stories and then you're gonna leave the best story for last, right? You're gonna leave the, and so think about like these guys, these authors writing a story, and, like, like telling it about their best friend. It's not gonna be always in the right order, but it's gonna, gonna convey to you who that person is. And that person is Jesus. We're gonna learn to him. And we're going to learn very quickly that he is the guy that all those books of the Old Testament were leading us to, were pointing us to. He's going to be this guy that we're all waiting on. And these books tell us just how cool he actually is. And these are, these are the synoptic gospels, meaning that these three tell a similar story. And I'm going to tell you about these real quick. Starting off with Mark. Why? Because we believe that Mark was actually written down first, sometime between 50, in the 50s and 60s AD, which will be about 20 years after the death of Jesus, that these were written down. And the reason I'm telling you all this is because I want to try to paint you a picture. It's like, if I draw this stick man over here, it's like, hey, here's a man, right? It's like, okay, cool. Do we know anything about that guy? No, not really. But if I draw in like some mountains in the background, some trees, and you know, like just like some bushes and like a little river or something like that, okay, cool. You can kind of begin to understand a little more about this guy and what, it, what he's about. So I'm gonna give you a little background about each gospel and actually why and who they were written to, so that way you can kind of better understand when you're reading the scripture. Again, uh, to be able to get more out of it. So we're gonna try. We're gonna start with that. So anyway, Saint Mark here. Uh, Gospel of St. Mark, written sometime around 50s or 60s AD, and so during this time, we got to think, Jesus has been, Jesus has about, been dead for about 20 years, and rose. <laughs> Spoiler alert, I guess. Um, uh, so, at this time, uh, there's a like, heavy persecution of anyone who claims to be Christian during this time. So you got to think in your head, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all telling a very careful story. They could be killed for writing this down. So they have to tell the story very carefully and to who they speak to and how they have to speak about it. They're very careful about how they do this. And Mark um, is written by uh, St. Mark, who was an apostle of. Does anyone know who St. Mark was an apostle of? Taking a guess, anybody? Uh, it's going to be St. Peter. So none other than St. Peter. So Mark was written by uh, an apostle or a disciple of St. Peter. 
And so basically Mark is from the oral tradition, the, the, the spoken words of St. Peter and his witness to Jesus, uh, his witness, his own witness to Jesus. So, uh, so it's pretty cool to know that Mark is from, uh, is from Peter. And, but also Mark is probably the, uh, the least elegantly written gospel. It's, you know, it's basically, it gets you all the bare bones information. It really just, it doesn't speak very beautifully, but it gets you all the, in, the important stuff and kind of gets you there. But with Mark, there's like this weird thing where he kind of, he focuses on the messianic secrets. And like he focuses on not really revealing all too much about who Jesus is. And Jesus also says a lot in Mark's gospel, like, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody about this. And it's weird. It's like, why is he saying that stuff? Because at the time, um, in order to capture the audience of the people he was writing for, so St. Mark and St. Peter were Jews, and they were writing for a Jewish audience, he couldn't come out and explicitly say that Jesus is Lord. He had to use some sort of language that was going to get the Jewish people to also kind of like buy into this. You'll see this in, Ma in Mark. used a lot in Mark and Matthew. There's this language that... It's a low, what we call Christology, but at the same, but uh, what that means is basically uh, how much does the author portray Jesus as the Messiah? Like how how well does he does it? And they don't necessarily have a, much of a Christology, but they do portray Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, fulfilling the role of the Jewish Messiah here, and. Um, and that was done because their audience was mainly Jews. They were writing for the Jewish people um, for, for them to tell that story. Um, so we're going to go on to Matthew uh, real quick. And I'm just going to say that Matthew's gospel uh, was written a little bit after, probably 60s or 70s AD. And uh, it's written a little bit more eloquently because it's written by St. Matthew, if you remember correctly in the gospels. Matthew is the tax collector that Jesus invites to bring and be a disciple of, of, of him. And so like, it was written by Matthew. So Matthew was more of a learned person. He had more of an ability to write. And so his writing is a little more elegant, a little more beautiful. But it's also written towards a Jewish audience. So a lot of the things in Matthew's Gospels are going to be written to, for those who have a Jewish background. Which is why we learned, well, like learning the Old Testament with Miss Haley last week is so very important just to understanding these first two books of the Bible because you have to understand the context in which they're written. You know, like the little background of the little stick man? You have to understand that context in order to understand just what these two guys are actually talking about. Um, oh, also fun fact, Jesus quotes the Old Testament a lot. Can you know which, God, which book of the Old Testament is Jesus' favorite? Take a guess. It's actually the book of Isaiah because he quotes it the most whenever he's speaking. Fun fact, now you know. Um, so if you want to know a little more about Jesus, do you think we should probably go back and read the prophet Isaiah? Probably so. That's probably a good idea because he quotes that the most. <laughs> um, so moving on, uh, Matthew, written again, written by Jewish people for Jew, And you can see in his genealogy of Jesus, you know that like really long, awkward part at the beginning of the gospel where it's like, this person is the son of this person, the son of this person, who beget, who beget, who beget, who beget. You know that long like thing? You can see that right there in his, that he's trying to fulfill the role of Jesus as the, as the Jewish Messiah because he starts, the, he starts it with Abraham, which is the start of the Jewish nation, and he ends with Jesus as the climax of the Jewish history. So he starts with Abraham and ends with Jesus. So he's trying to convey Jesus through the, in context of all of Jewish history. And he starts and stops there. Whereas we go to Luke. Now Luke is a little bit different. But he's still included in this group here because, he, because Luke actually pulls, and Luke is written after both of these because it's, it's known that Luke has actually cited both of these other two Gospels. So Luke pulls from these other two Gospels. And so his was, no, we know he, was, he wrote after these two guys. Um, and so what Luke does, Luke comes at the perspective of he's not taught, he's not, He's, he, so St. Luke is a, a disciple of who, do we know? St. Paul. And St. Paul is not a Jewish person by, by birth. He was converted, right? So he was Saul, became Paul in the Acts of the Apostles, which we'll get to that in a second. Um, it's kind of crazy talking about scripture, and I'm also like quoting scripture, like you should know this at the same time. It's, this is interesting, but bear with me. You're doing a good job. Um, so uh, in Luke's gospel, who is writing from St. Paul, who is... He's mostly speaking to the Gentiles. He's mostly speaking to 
Jesus as the universal savior of all of mankind. And we see this, so in diff the only difference between Matthew and Luke here is like in Luke's um, genealogy, he starts with Jesus and goes all the way back to Adam. And he wants to link Jesus as the new man. It's like all the way back, redeeming all of mankind, Jesus as a universal savior. So Luke, also very eloquently written, and you know you can tell this person was a learned person when he wrote this, when he wrote his gospel. Instead of him just speaking to the Jews, he's speaking to the whole world. So when you're reading Luke, um, you're reading you're reading as someone who wants to convey Jesus as Savior of the world, and so that's important to know when you're reading Luke's gospel, and he tells us that story. And so in Luke's gospel, we also see some really cool things. Like in some beautiful prayers, like uh, I believe the uh, the Canticle of Mary or the Magnificat prayer is a huge focal point of Luke's gospel. Stories about Mary in Luke's gospel, un, like beautiful. Like I, I, I'm a mama's boy. I love Mama Mary. Um, so like I always love reading Luke's gospel and like his portrayal of the Blessed Mother. Um, just beautiful stories there. Um, and so moving on, and I'm just going to go to John really quickly. So like these three are like kind of middle of the road, low Christology, and then we get to John. John comes in swinging, because at this point, um, John writes his gospel after all these three are written, so we're thinking like 80s, potentially 80s or 90 AD. Um, and so everyone in the area at the time is familiar with these three writings by now. So John comes in swinging, and he's like, I'm not afraid, because everyone now knows that Jesus is the Messiah. I'm taking the gloves off. In chapter 1, right out the gate, I'm going to say, in the beginning there was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And then the Word became flesh. And it's like, whoa, hold up. Did you just come out and say that Jesus is God? And yes, like right there, boom, chapter 1. So John comes out swinging. And John knows that like I have to clear the air. I have to say it. I have to come out... We have to say what we know, what we're hinting at in these three other Gospels. We have to come out right now and we have to say it real, as loudly as we can. So that way there's no confusion as to who Jesus is. Um, and so John's Gospel straight up comes out and says it. Uh, again, John is a Jew. He is writing towards Jewish people, but he's also writing about like, the Lord as the, the sacrificial lamb, the bread of life. Like you have all these, these beautiful discourses that come from John. John is a very is a very Catholic book of the Bible, <laughs> to say the least, because it looks at, at the Last Supper like Jesus is the Paschal Lamb. It focuses, it even shifts a couple of the days around of the of the Passion. Um, that that like this is a little bit different like on certain days than these. But it does so to make the, the point, to drive the point home that Jesus is the Lamb of God um, who has been sent to take away the sins of the world and to understand this again, to understand what does the sacrificial Lamb, how does that play into this again, we need the Old Testament to figure that out. Um, so that's, the, that's kind of a general uh, like backdrop of the four Gospels. But ultimately, guys and gals, the four, uh, the four Gospels are here they're, they're the spoken word of Jesus Christ. They're the spoken word of Jesus Christ that were written down by these four great men. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, two of which were disciples of Jesus, and then the other two were like once removed disciples of Jesus. Does that make sense? But they were, but they wrote based upon the spoken word of someone else who did see him or witnessed him or was was there even in the moments directly after it, like the, in the case of Saint Luke and Saint Paul. Um, but ultimately, guys, the Gospels communicate a story of who Jesus is. They don't tell you about him. They want to tell you who he is, what he's like, and how he desires to be in relationship. He comes down. Uh, he op uh, we, we open the, the scene with, with Mama Mary being visited by the ga uh, angel Gabriel. And, and, she, and we, we begin by her, by her fiat, her yes. And it starts this huge chain of events where Jesus is born. Jesus, they're sitting to the desert. They're, um, they, uh, they come back, and, like, Jesus is baptized, and like, like he consecrates this, this, this beautiful act of baptism. He, he makes this now the Lord. Like, think of like whenever Jesus does something in the Gospels, he's consecrating it. He consecrates every form of human, human life, from birth to just living to eating, and, but also he consecrates everything for like suffering and death. 
on the cross. And he comes and he makes it beautiful. He makes it with a purpose. He comes and he redeems every act of humanity in the process. And ultimately, the story is Jesus comes, gets baptized, and he immediately does what? He goes into the desert. Well, why does he go into the desert? He goes into the desert, and I'm going to speak into the fellows real quick. Like, you're going to get this really quickly, girls. You know, bear with me. Uh, <laughs> um, but, like, he goes in the desert to take the gloves off and go a couple rounds with Jesus. I mean, go a couple rounds with the devil, okay? Because the devil is humanity's greatest enemy, greatest foe. He's, the, he's the, been the biggest bully of our entire existence from day one. And Jesus goes straight into the desert and says, we're going to spend 40 days, me and you, and I'm going to tell you who is now who is now in control of this world, who has authority. These are my people, and you're not going to hurt them anymore. And then he emerges from the desert, right? After fighting every temptation, foregoing food, he didn't have to do any of that. But he did it. Why? To come out of the desert going, hey, all of humanity, listen here. I've got some really good news for you. That bully that was been messing with y'all for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, you don't have to worry about him anymore. I mean, he's still going to be around. Don't get me wrong. But you got something here that can defeat him now. And I just did in the desert. Now I'm coming out. And then he got friends to surround him. He got people to come around him. And he could have done this all by himself, but he didn't. Why? Because he desires relationship. He desires community. He desires people. He desires you. He desires the human heart. And he shows us that in his, in his earthly ministry here. He got people to, to be with him, to walk with him, to journey with him, to be close to him. Why? Because that's his whole goal. He wants to be close. He could have just come in here and just, you know, stomped the devil on the face and walked off. But he didn't. He came in here and he did it certain ways. And those ways are important. Not just, we're just reading a story. We're reading everything that he did was important and why he did it. He came here and he got friends. He, he made friends. He made brotherhood. He, um, and a fun fact that I always like to, to look at, some difference between some of the Gospels and some of the brotherhood that exists. For instance, in Mark's Gospel, whenever Jesus uh, emerges from the tomb, uh, you see, he says, in Mark's Gospel, and keep in mind, he's a disciple of Peter. So Peter's take on um, Jesus coming out of the tomb and like the, the stone being rolled back was that two disciples encountered the stone being rolled back. And he didn't, he didn't add any more details than that. But in John's Gospel... <laughs> John makes sure to tell, he goes, um, <laughs> he says, oh, John, the beloved disciple, ran past Peter and beat him, to, like he, in a foot race, to the, to, the, uh, to the empty tomb. You know, Peter's not going to say he got beat to the tomb, but John was like, everybody's going to know about this, Peter. Everyone's going to know that I just smoked you in this foot race, and it's going to be for the rest of history. So you can see this kind of polite, playful banter between guys who were brothers, and like, you're always going to, like, if it's the guys that are competing against one another, if you're like, if I'm in my, uh, my fantasy football league that I play with some guys, if I beat one of them, they're going to know about it for at least a week or two. And I'm going to let them know about it. But at the end of the day, those brothers know I have their back, even if I'm politely playing with them. But you can see that brotherhood exists between these two guys, and they did so in, um, because Jesus brought them together. It's a beautiful thing. And so even amongst the Gospels, there's fun little stories and little tidbits that you can pick up on. That, that really connect that brotherhood that Jesus was going for, that relationship Jesus was yearning for. And you can see it in just that one little example between just the differences in those two stories. Um, so I always find that fun. Um, and if you're ever looking for a place to start reading the, reading the Bible, start with the Gospels. Start with what Jesus said. And if you have a question like, what did he mean by that? What did, what did he mean by that? What was he referencing? And then go back and read the story he was referencing. Go back to Isaiah. Go back to Ezekiel. Go back to these other places to understand the context in which it was written. And then it'll all start to make sense. All right, so after, after we get to the Gospels, I'm just going to kind of run through the rest of the, the, rest of the New Testament. Because uh, the Gospel is really most important where you need to put your focus. But the other parts are, are awesome, are really awesome. And like these letters, like... So much cool stuff in them, so I'm just going to run through them real quick. Right after the Gospels, we have Acts. Basically, from, from the death and resurrection of Jesus, um, all the way through, like, I think it leaves off about 62 AD. So it's like, this, is, this covers a great stretch of human history right here. Uh, between with the birth of the church and the, Holy, the descent of the Holy Spirit, the first, apo like the first apostles, um, the first like conversions, the first martyrs, 
Uh, you're going to learn about what life was like in the early church right here. All the persecutions they had to deal with um, under under the Roman uh, uh, occupation of a lot of these areas. Like Rome was the was under control of all the areas in Acts, and what you learn very quickly is that Rome, Rome, basically their religion, their pagan religion, like you know gods and goddesses and stuff like that. They that was a part of their like uh, patriotism to the to the to the empire of Rome. So basically. If you didn't sacrifice to their gods or goddesses, you were considered to be a traitor, a bad guy. So, um, so you can see how that's going to present maybe a problem if you are a believer in Jesus, because you're not going to sacrifice to uh, to a, a god that's not Jesus. And so, and so um, you can see that in Acts we start to see a lot of the issues that our that our early church had to face. Next up are 21 letters. Um, most of them were written by St. Paul. However, we also have letters from Peter, James, John, and I think Jude is one of them. Um, and there's one letter, uh, there's a couple letters we don't know the true author on, but for all sake and, all sake and purposes, we just say St. Paul. When in doubt, we just say St. Paul. Um, however, let's look at these. So, there's 21 letters. They are written by the leaders of the church at the time, and they're written to different areas. You'll see words like St. Uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, all those other things. What does that mean? Um, these are groups of people uh, that, that are, that this was the early churches of the day. So think about like St. Paul writing a letter to the Ephesians. That would be like Pope Francis writing a letter to Bishop Duca of Baton Rouge to, to then for Bishop Duca to tell all the people in the Diocese of Baton Rouge, like, like, what's up, Bishop? How's everything going? Sorry about the hurricane and the pandemic and the pandurricane and everything in between. You know, like, how, you know, like the, just, just think about that when you're thinking about these letters. It's the leader of the church writing to a church in an area. So, uh, when we see Corinthians or Ephesians, that's St. Paul writing a letter to the church in the city of Corinth or the city of Ephesus. And these are all really beautiful um, letters that are very rich because we start to see the beginning of something called theology, which is the beginning of faith-seeking understanding. It's St. Paul, St. Peter, and St. James, and St. John. They're all unpacking the good news of the gospel. They're trying to help it make sense. They're trying to, because you people right now are struggling with it. There's a lot of confusion. It's like, think of, there's not like a TV broadcast. There's no instant messenger. There's no, um, you know, there's no like Snapchats. There's no texting. There is letters. And sometimes when you have to tell a letter, there's only one of them. And then that person has to run and tell three different people. Well, ha what happens if like the message gets a little twisted or maybe he didn't hear quite that well? Well, there's going to be a lot of confusion that creates. So these letters are helping kind of dispel some of the false teachings that pop up as a result of some of the confusion because now we're, no one really knows about this Jesus guy. We're learning about him. And so this is St. Paul being a true leader and St. James. These are guys that are being true leaders and trying to convey the beauty of the faith to those who, who need help, but they're desiring to know. And, they're, and most of these churches in these areas aren't like churches in what we know today. Not like a big building with a you know, big cross on the top of it. These were underground churches. These were churches that had to meet in secret. These were churches that were meeting inside of people's houses and quiet at the dead of night to, to perform the Mass or the early version of the Mass in order so, so they could survive. And this is how the church made it through the first couple centuries. Um, and then lastly, we have this beautiful book, which is the book of Revelation, or in some translations, it's the apocalypse. And so when we hear that word, the apocalypse, usually we think of like, oh my gosh, the end of the world, right? Or, you know, everything's going down. But in reality, the word apocalypse comes from a Greek word meaning the unveiling or the revealing. And so what we see in Revelation is it's the only one of its kind in the New Testament, even though we see a lot of it in the Old Testament, but it's the only prophetic book that we have in the New Testament. And it gives us an unveiling of a heavenly reality. It's, it's really weird language, it's really weird symbolism and things, but it's a vision, so we believe the author of this book is St. John, while he's, uh, he's been exiled to the Isle of Patmos, and while he's sitting there, he's writing, he's writing um, some scripture, he's writing down certain things, um, 
But the main thing is he writes this book of Revelation, and it's about all of the things in this vision he has, he sees, and he writes them all down. And so the first part of Revelation is actually not about destruction or dismay or you know disaster. It's actually very beautiful. It's actually the story of the 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 the, uh, the banquet of the Lamb, the 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 wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven. And if you pay close attention to the first seven chapters of Revelation, you should see something very familiar. And it's kind of like a basic framework for the Catholic Mass, for the for or what we see on Sundays in, in every one of our churches. So the book of Revelation isn't all doom and gloom. It's actually kind of beautiful. It actually paints a beautiful story of the wedding feast. Um, the second half is a prophetic, is also a prophetic uh, uh, sort of story or kind of vision or warning, if you want to say, about about a lot of it's about some tribulation, some things that are going to happen, and some some ways to read it. It's about the things that were happening at the time and with the Roman persecution, but also that another way of reading it is things that are yet to come. And so, uh, but he goes all that. I just want to say this about Revelation. He says all those things in Revelation only to set up the victory of Christ. So there's a lot of terrible things that are going on. There's a lot of terrible things that go on in our world today. But it's all to, to set up the beautiful victory of Jesus at the end of everything. When he comes and makes all things new and all things good, and he ushers in that new kingdom that was promised in the four Gospels when he originally came down, he said, I'm going to come back. And then Revelation is the story of what that's going to kind of look like. Um, but again, it's not meant to scare you. It's not meant to... It's not meant to um, make us live in fear is to do the exact opposite is to give us hope that even when things look bad outside there's a hurricane coming there's like there's all kind of craziness going on there's a pandemic we have to wear a mask it's like hey jesus is like chill 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 i got this i'm coming back it's gonna be okay don't worry about it i got you and so ultimately that's what the story of revelation is supposed to be it's not supposed to be a scary story it's supposed to it's supposed to el like elicit that hope that that was originally promised up here it's just supposed to echo that and be like hey guys don't worry bad stuff's coming but good stuff's coming right after it i promise i promise so if you ask me what the bible is about what is it for what's its purpose well number one is obviously to, 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 to tell us who god is and what he's like and what he desires for us um, but number two is to give humanity hope. It's to give humanity hope that no matter how far you strayed away, no matter how much of a mess you've made of this life and this world, that there is a way back home. There is a way back to the Father. There's a way back to just beauty and love. And it's available to you no matter what because God himself in these Gospels came down to humanity and it became creation, became his very creation, took on that identity. And, and he died because he said that you were worth it. You are worth it. No matter how much, like, worthless you might think you are or anything, uh, anything that may pop into your head that's not true because what he comes down, because Jesus is what? The truth, the way, the truth, the life. So when Jesus says, I'm going to die for you, he's speaking truth. He's saying that you are not worthless. And I'm going to show you that you're not worthless because I'm going to die for you. And I'm going to die for you. You know why? Because whenever I am raised back up, I don't want to go back up alone. I want you with me. That's the truth. That's the truth. And like we can put any kind of lie in our head that says that that's not right. But in this gospel, in this scripture, we are given hope because it says it and it's there. And we understand, we know it to be true. We know it to be, we know it to be real. So the ultimate story um, of Jesus is one of redemption and consecration. He came down, he, he redeemed this world. He redeemed our hearts. He redeemed this life and he consecrated every little bit of it, including suffering. If you're in the midst of a period of suffering in your life or is there something that you're struggling with, um, just know that the Lord came down and consecrated suffering. So that way, if you're struggling, you can turn it into something beautiful. And, and like, because like whenever the Lord is suffering, uh, whenever you're suffering, you can bring it to him and you guys can turn that into some form of hope. You can turn it into something else, not just for yourself, but for someone else too. Have you ever saw, saw someone that was carrying something very heavy, but they were carrying it very well, and they knew that they had hope throughout their midst of their suffering? Doesn't that give you hope too? Think of like a great hero movie 
when the hero look, like looks into the eyes of the evil and he's like he's not scared, right? Because he knows he knows he knows like what he's doing is good and noble. At the end of the day, it's that same kind of mentality that Jesus gives to us in the midst of our suffering that we can not only give hope, he not only gives hope to us, but we can give hope to others as well. And so what is scripture? Scripture is hope. And anytime you're in need of hope, anytime like whether it's like you're in the midst of like this, you're preparing for a very important moment of your life, you're in the middle of a low or loss, or you're just in that awkward in-between moment, hope can be found and it can be found right here. It can be found right here. It's contained in these books. You start here, go here, go here, go there, do whatever you got to do, but it's there. It's there for you if you just open yourself up to it. And I'm not asking you to do anything crazy. I'm not asking you to do anything crazy at all. But what I am asking you to do at this point in your life is just be open to the fact that hope can be found here. You don't have to do it right. You don't have to do it perfect. Guys, I'm like in my 30s. I don't do it perfect. I don't get it right every time. I mess up a lot. But I know where to go to reorient myself. I know where to go to get back at it every single time. And so that's, if I had to give you anything, is to never lose hope and find it here. Always find it here and it's available to you. Thank you for listening. I hope you got something out of this today. I hope something in here might change your life. You might go and actually read scripture. And I challenge you, go and read scripture. And it can just be one gospel a week. And it can be the gospel that's coming up on Sundays. So that way when you hear it in the, in the week, uh, like in, at that Sunday's mass, you're not like caught off guard. And you're like, oh, I remember reading that this week. You can just do that one one gospel a week and uh, you can just prepare your heart a little bit better each week, be a little bit closer to Jesus in the Word. So I hope you guys can do that. I hope you guys had some fun today. I know I had a lot of fun doing this. Uh, thanks to Ansley and everybody for having me. And uh, see you later.